Good morning. Scott Luton here with you on this edition of This Week in Business History. Welcome to today's show. On this program, which is part of the Supply Chain Now family of programming, we take a look back at the upcoming week, and then we share some of the most relevant events and milestones from years past. Of course, mostly business-focused, with a little dab of global supply chain, and occasionally, we might just throw in a good story outside of our primary realm. So I invite you to join me on this look back in history to identify some of the most significant leaders, companies, innovations, and perhaps lessons learned in our collective business journey. Now, let's dive in to this week in business history. Hello, and thanks for joining us. My name is Gary Smith, and I'll be sitting in for Scott Luton as your guest host on this edition of This Week in Business History. This episode, we are focused on the events that occurred during the week of December 13th through the 19th. Thanks so much for listening to the show. We're going to discuss one of those truly seminal moments in history. It's one of those moments that if you were alive to witness it, you would always remember where you were and what you were doing when it happened. However, people today only know this particular seminal moment from history books, yet it was a day that truly changed the course of history. It spawned at least three industries, countless companies, and a whole new engineering field of study. You've heard the basic story, but I'm sure that you'll be surprised by some of these details. Stay tuned, and thanks for joining us here on This Week in Business History, powered by the team at the Supply Chain Now. This is the story of the Wright brothers and the dawn of modern aviation. Wilbur Wright was born in Minville, Indiana on April 16, 1867 to Milton and Susan Wright. A little known fact, Milton Wright's mother, Catherine Reeder, was of Dutch descent and was a distant relative of New York's famous Vanderbilt family. Wilbur's brother Orville was born in Dayton, Ohio on August 19, 1871. Their father was a bishop in the Church of the United Brethren of Christ and traveled frequently. The family moved numerous times, but permanently settled in Dayton in 1884. On one of his business trips, their father, who was a big believer in the educational value of toys, brought them a toy that flew. This toy was basically an invention by the French aeronautical pioneer Alphonse Pernod. The boys played with it enthusiastically, but eventually it broke, as most toys do. However, unlike other children who would simply have thrown it away, Wilbur and or Orville studied the construction and built their own exact replica to play with. The boys would later say that this experience sparked their initial interest in flying. Although the brothers were separated in age by over four years, they were as inseparable as twins. They ate together, played together, worked together, and yes, even argued together. Although both attended high school and were good students, neither graduated. Wilbur once said that they even, quote, thought together. Also, it was said that their voices were so much alike that if you heard one of them talking, you could not tell which one it was without actually seeing them. In 1889, Orville dropped out of high school and built his own printing press. Together with Wilbur, they started a weekly newspaper, The West Side News. Wilbur was its editor. It became a daily in 1890 and was called The Evening Item. However, it lasted only four months. After that, they focused on commercial printing. Another interesting fact is that one of their printing clients was a high school friend of Orville's named Lawrence Dunbar. Dunbar would go on to become a prominent African-American poet and writer in the late 1890s. The Wright brothers opened a bicycle and repair shop in 1892 called the Wright Cycle Exchange. It capitalized on the bicycle craze that occurred after the invention of what was then called the quote safety bicycle. This bicycle was not dissimilar in design to the two wheelers of today, but we'll leave that story for another time. The brothers began manufacturing their own bicycles in 1896 as the Wright Cycle Company. They used the profits from this company to fund their growing interest in flight. Here they were primarily influenced by the works of Sir George Cayley, 
Leonardo da Vinci, Octave Cheneau, and Otto Lilienthal. Through their research, the brothers became convinced that the secret to flight was in the control of the glide, as opposed to using sheer power of an engine for control. Thus, Orbel and Wilbur focused on pilot control. This led to the concept of wing warping, which consisted of a system of pulleys to twist the edges of the wings in opposite directions, allowing the aircraft to bank or lean as it turned to change direction. Later airplane designs would use ailerons to bank the airplane because this design proved to be much more stable. The brothers spent much of their time between 1900 and 1902 designing and testing gliders and working towards perfecting their pilot control theory of flight. By 1903, they added power to their machine. The original Wright Flyer was constructed of spruce with a skin of muslin. The propellers were also made of wood, and the brothers used wind tunnel tests to determine their length and construction. They decided on using twin pusher propellers, both about eight feet long and made of laminated spruce. Working with their in-house mechanic, Charlie Taylor, they constructed an engine in just six weeks. The engine featured a block cast of aluminum, which was rare in those days, a primitive carburetor, and no fuel pump. Fuel was gravity fed. The original Wright Flyer had a wingspan of 40.3 feet and weighed 605 pounds. It had a 12 horsepower engine and weighed 180 pounds. The total investment in the aircraft was less than $1,000, the equivalent of $28,000 today. That was still quite a bargain. The brothers chose the dunes of near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina to initially test their gliders and ultimately the Wright Flyer because the dunes at Kill Devil Hills were large and the constant wind provided lift for their aircraft. The original flight was scheduled for December 14, 1903. This was to commemorate the 121st anniversary of the first hot air balloon flight by the Montgolfier brothers in 1782. A coin toss, won by Wilbur, determined who would pilot the aircraft first. The maiden flight was a failure. After three seconds in the air, Wilbur stalled the aircraft and it crashed, causing minor damage. The second attempt occurred on December 17th. It was a chilly, dry day with temperatures in the low 40s and about a 20 mile an hour wind. Orville took his turn. This time, it was successful. The first flight occurred at 10.35 a.m. and lasted a total of 12 seconds, covering 120 feet at a blistering speed of 6.8 miles per hour. The next two flights, by Wilbur and Orville respectively, covered 175 and 200 feet and reached an altitude of 10 feet. On the fourth and final flight of the day, Wilbur again took the controls. Orville wrote of the final flight of that day, quote, Wilbur had started the fourth and last flight at just about 12 o'clock. The first few hundred feet were up and down as before, but by the time 300 feet had been covered, the machine was under much better control. The course of the next four or 500 feet had but little undulation. However, when at about 800 feet, the machine began pitching again and in one of its darts downward struck the ground. The distance over the ground was measured at 852 feet. The time of the flight was 59 seconds. The frame supporting the front rudder was badly broken, but the main part of the machine was not injured at all. We estimated that the machine could be put into condition for flight again in about a day or two. After the flight, the brothers sent a telegram to their father informing them of their success and asking that he, quote, inform press, end quote. Interestingly enough, the Dayton Journal refused to print the story, saying that the news of such a short flight was unimportant. However, a telegraph operator leaked the story to a paper in Virginia who ran a highly inaccurate version the next day. This story was picked up by a number of newspapers, including the previously mentioned Dayton Journal. Incredibly, though, the news of the first powered flight did not really create a lot of excitement with the general public. The Wright brothers published their story in January of 1904, but interest soon faded. Years later, the Dayton newspapers actually celebrated the Wright brothers as hometown and national heroes. 
However, when asked why the local press first ignored this seminal moment in history, newspaper publisher and 1920 Democratic presidential candidate James B. Cox, the founder of Cox Broadcasting, was quoted to say, quote, frankly, none of us believed it. In 1904, the Wright brothers built the Wright Flyer II. They decided to forgo the relocation to Kitty Hawk and set up an airfield in a cow pasture in Huffman Prairie, about 13 miles from Dayton. After several less than spectacular flights, press attention died down yet again. This allowed the brothers to continue their experimentation and research in relative anonymity, which they preferred. By 1909, the Wright brothers formed the Wright Company to manufacture their aircraft designs. With each design and each flight, they learned more and more about powered flight. They flew together once in 1910, but then promised their family that they would never fly together again in order to avoid an accident that may kill them both. On another occasion, Orville took his 82-year-old father on a seven-minute flight. They reached an altitude of 350 feet with their father Milton shouting, Higher, Orville! Higher! Competition finally came to airplane manufacturing, and unfortunately from 1910 to 1914, the Wright brothers were enmeshed in patent lawsuits for their plane design with the Curtis Company. Then in 1912, tragedy struck. Wilbur Wright died suddenly of typhoid fever at the age of 45. Two years later, in January of 1914, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the Curtis Company did indeed infringe on the original Wright brothers' patent. Orville felt vindicated, but since Wilbur's untimely death, he no longer was interested in running the company. He sold the Wright Company in 1915. You see, while the brothers had always taken credit for their work as a team, Wilbur was the actual driving force and formed the public face of the corporation. Soon after selling his company, Orville retired from business and then served on various boards and committees. In an ironic twist, the Wright Company merged with the Curtis Company in 1929 to form the Curtis Wright Company, which to this day is a manufacturer of high-tech components for the aerospace industry. In 1944, 40 years after the brothers' first flight, a Lockheed Constellation, piloted by Howard Hughes and TWA President Jack Fry, flew from Burbank, California to Washington, D.C. in six hours and 57 minutes, averaging 330.9 miles an hour. On its return flight, the pair stopped in Dayton, Ohio. Here, they gave 73-year-old Orville Wright his last airplane ride. Orville is said to have briefly taken the controls. He later quipped that the Constellation's wingspan was longer than his original flight. Orville's last major project was restoring a Wright Flyer III, which is considered by historians to be the first practical aircraft. Orville Wright died in January of 1948 of a heart attack. Like his brother, he never married. Orville, however, lived to see the invention that he and his brother built transform the world. His life spanned from the horse and buggy days to the dawn of supersonic flight. Ironically, John T. Daniels, the photographer who took the iconic photographs of the first flight in 1903, died just one day after Orville. At the end of World War II, Orville Wright expressed some sadness about the death and destruction caused by the machine that he and his brother built. He's quoted as saying, we dared to hope we had invented something that would bring lasting peace to the earth, but we were wrong. No, I don't have any regrets about my part in the, event, in the invention of the airplane, although no one could deplore more than I do the destruction that it caused. I feel about the airplane much the same as I do in regard to fire. That is, I regret all the terrible damage caused by fire, but I think that it is good that for the human race that someone discovered how to start fires and that we have learned to put fire to thousands of important uses. So that is the story of the Wright brothers and the dawn of modern aviation. To Benny, the invention of the airplane ranks in importance with the invention of the printing press, the steam engine, and the automobile. It changed history and it spawned at least three major industries the aircraft manufacturing industry, the air cargo industry, and the passenger airline industry. The first air cargo flight took place on November 7, 1910, when a package 
carrying 200 pounds of silk was flown from Dayton, Ohio to Columbus, Ohio for a store opening. The aircraft was a Wright Model B. On January 1st, 1914, the first regularly scheduled aircraft our airline passenger service began between St. Petersburg, Florida and Tampa, Florida. While the endeavor lasted only four months, it paved the way for the beginning of the passenger airline industry. What we have learned from the study of aeronautics has set the stage for the jet age, supersonic flight, and what would be mankind's next great adventure, going to the moon and safely returning just a scant 66 years after that first flight. A few other items of note on this week in business history for the week of December 13th through the 19th. On December 14, 1799, George Washington, the first president of the United States, died at his home in Mount Vernon, Virginia. On December 16th, 1863, philosopher George Santayana was born in Madrid, Spain. As a child, he emigrated to the United States and eventually taught at Harvard University. Santayana's best known quote was, quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. This quote is one of my personal favorites. December 18, 1916, during the World War I, the Battle of Verdun concluded after 10 months of fighting in which 543,000 French and 434,000 German soldiers were killed. On December 19, 1732, Benjamin Franklin first published Poor Richard's Almanac, containing weather predictions, humor, proverbs, epigrams, and eventually selling nearly 10,000 copies per year. Also on December 19th, but in 1997, the movie Titanic starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet opened. It had a budget of 200 million and grossed 28.6 million in its first weekend. It would go on to gross $2.1 billion worldwide. Well, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Business History. My thanks to Scott Luton for allowing me to guest host this week. I've considered it an honor. Thank you, Scott. Those are the stories that stood out for us, but what do you think? Find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram, and share your comments there. We're here to listen. Thank you and goodbye.